Welcome to the Blended Finance Project interview series, where we talk to international development and solidarity scholars, labor and civil society activists about the recent turn to so-called innovative finance for development in Canada. I'm your host, Susan Spronk, Associate Professor at the School of International Development and Global Studies at the University of Ottawa. So this interview is divided into two parts. In part one, we look at problems with blended finance, including the problem that COVID-19 has created in essential services, the role that finance has played in the privatization of essential services, and also financialization and why it should matter to international development, practitioners, solidarity activists, and researchers. In part two, we'll talk about alternatives. Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, it's great to see you again. I'm here today with Thomas Marois, who is a senior lecturer at SOAS, uh, which is the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. As well, he is a senior research fellow uh, with the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, University College London. I'm also here with David McDonald, who is a professor at the Department of Global Development Studies and also the founder and director of the Municipal Services Project. And one thing uh, we have all in common is we're all also Canadian citizens. So we're here to talk about development in Canada today. So welcome uh, to both of you and thanks for joining us. Thanks Susan. Here. Great. So the first question I have for you is how has the COVID-19 pandemic exposed the failure of privatization of essential services? David? Yeah, um, I don't know if it's so much uh, exposed as uh, further exposed or revealed new dimensions of um, it's I think it's really a matter of scale. Um, and I think I would answer that in three ways, um, all of which are related to, you know, non COVID times. Uh, but I think COVID has, has just exacerbated is the word I was looking for. Um, the, the problems broadly of, of privatization. And, and I would define privatization for your listeners as, as not just uh, services that are owned and operated entirely by the private sector, but uh, contracting out uh, short-term, long-term, et cetera. So that sort of wide gamut of public-private partnerships uh, as well. Um, and let me just also throw in there the, the additional problem of, of corporatization. So these are public, uh, publicly owned and publicly managed entities, water utilities, electricity utilities, that are increasingly run like private corporations and they operate very much in a kind of silo mentality. So uh, it, it's not as bad as when things are contracted out or owned entirely by the private sector, but it's, it's a similar kind of continuity in terms of more holistic thinking about public services, which, which I'll get to in a moment. So let, let me start with the more direct private sector involvement. And I think one of the biggest problems that we've seen with COVID-19 is what happens when you have a profit seeking firm suddenly faced with a situation where they have to manage uh, all kinds of additional expenditures and revenue shortfalls uh, that we've seen across the board with, uh, with with COVID-19. Um, you look at water utilities, massive drops in revenues, as well as uh, huge increases in PPE and developing new online systems, et cetera. And this, this is really cut across virtually every public service we, we can think of. Um, and uh, you know, it's, been a, it's been a big struggle for public uh, agencies, but private companies uh, by definition have to break even or, or make a profit. Um, and so, although there hasn't been really systematic uh, research done on this, um, you know, research in the past has certainly shown that the first thing private companies will do is figuring out a way to cut corners. Um, so reducing the quality of services, reducing the health and safety of their employees, um, cutting off services to low income households or, or reducing the, the service level. Um, you know, we've seen this with long-term healthcare facilities uh, in the Canadian context, how private companies have, have responded to the uh, profit crisis uh, associated with COVID-19. So again, you know, this, is, this is a regular structural 
phenomenon associated with privatization, and I think COVID has just uh, exacerbated that. The second point is, um, particularly with contracting out, is a lack of flexibility. So uh, when you know a company has a five-year or 25-year contract to operate uh, some kind of a service, um, and something this unexpected, or I guess it's expected, but this out of the norm happens, um, it, it's very difficult to go back and renegotiate these contracts. And uh, so it you know, relates to my first point about the response of private companies is to cut back on, on spending and find ways to protect profit. Um, but it really hamstrings the level of government that has contracted a service out. And, uh, and that's one of the, again, one of the structural flaws of public-private partnerships is that uh, you know, these things are written not in stone, but uh, you know, in, in, in ink that uh, is very difficult and often very expensive for governments to to try and change in, in response to to a crisis. Um, and you know, COVID is is a, is a major crisis, but it's certainly not uh, unprecedented. It's certainly not the last time we're going to have a crisis. So that that whole you know sort of uh, flexibility that is it needs to be part of essential service delivery. Is is just functionally hamstrung uh, by the contracting out uh, model, and then the third point, which I've already alluded to, is the the kind of silo mentality that comes with uh, contracting out and privatization. And uh, you know, if you contract out your water services or your waste management services or whatever it might be, um, you you inherently lose the ability to communicate across departments. Um, and uh, so we see that kind of thing uh, has been in place for, for decades now with, with the contracting out in the neoliberal era. Um, and it's, it's just uh, exacerbated through a, a health crisis like this, where you need all hands on deck and you need the water people speaking with the health people, speaking with the education people, with the transportation people, et cetera. These things are all interconnected. And when, when you have the, the, the kind of uh, structural rigidity, uh, and siloed uh, uh, facet of, of private sector intervention. It makes that kind of broad holistic planning difficult. And that's true within uh, a jurisdiction like a municipality. Uh, it's also true across jurisdictions. And uh, you know, we, we may get to talk about why public services have done a better job, I think. And, and it's because they have been able to coordinate and, and communicate and share best practices. Um, across jurisdictions, and we've seen this with water operators, for example, uh, and, and that's not the kind of thing you see competitive private companies doing, sharing information with their competitors or with, with the public sector. So you, you lose that kind of cohesive, holistic emergency management planning within a jurisdiction and that broader public, public networking uh, across jurisdictions. So th those, I think, would be three of the, the, the most uh, pressing problems. Great, Tom, do you want to add something to that? Sure, if I could. Um, so I do more work on public banks and isn't necessarily an essential service, but it, it certainly is a still powerful service that uh, is provided through the, the state, through the public sector. There still are you know, nine, over 900 public banks worldwide with $49 trillion in assets. Um, but certainly this has shrunk in the era of privatization and neoliberalism. There are fewer banks and relatively fewer assets uh, compared to the GDP, but they're still, you know, running around 20% of total GDP or 20% of all banks, sorry, are, are public banks versus private. Um, but a lot of the, the issues that David pointed to in terms of privatization and corporatization of, of essential services, other public services, applied to the public banks as well. And you see in response to COVID that where public banks have been privatized or there are no public banks that there's in a sense reduced capacity to respond financially to the crisis, either in terms of retail services, like putting a pause on student loans or pause on, on mortgages or holidays on this or that, um, or, or you know, eliminating fees for, uh, doing online services, all these things happen within public banks, which are very difficult if it did, simply didn't happen at all in private banks. Alongside the very real difficulty where you can see 
quite distinct responses in those countries and jurisdictions where it was predominantly private banks, it was very difficult for the governments to get them to respond. Um, whereas where public banks had a substantial presence in countries, they could simply command them if there was a strong public mandate there to provide loans to health providers, water, cities, governments, et cetera. And it was, it was a matter of policy rather than trying to coerce them or use the carrot, which on the other side, essentially the public banks or public finance or public authorities ended up having to absorb all of the risk for the private financiers should they get involved in trying to manage the COVID crisis, trying to provide time so that people could sort of work their way through, especially the immediate onslaught of the crisis, but also the longer term implications. And this, I'm sure we're gonna come back to later, has everything to do with the whole sort of bending of public banks to private interests and the, the you know, in a sense, for private banks to be involved in COVID responses, you know, it's all in the, the language of, of sort of lending finance or using public guarantees uh, you know, to leverage private resources and so on. And this is an endemic problem. And it's, um, you know, it's one that uh, sort of flows across the, the finance and finance for development um, issues right now. But just quickly on the last point, and again, something that David brought up in terms of the potential within public services to sort of coordinate and collaborate with each other. You see the same thing in jurisdictions where there were public banks in operation in response to COVID, that you see sort of non-competitive collaboration experiences or, or processes emerging where the, there was, you know, some form of coordination between those public banks that received deposits and then channeling them into development banks where they might then use those, those funds for various infrastructure programs or whatever. Uh, you see collaboration between public pension funds, channeling money into development banks uh, and, and development banks and public banks in turn channeling money into the public health authorities, uh, into, into government coffers and so on in response to, to the crisis. And all of this is sort of non-competitive base. It's simply a matter of you know, coordinating within and across the, the, the sector. Um, and I think we'll probably come back to this later in terms of aid, but you also see in the context of Europe as well, um, very explicit coordination between the public development banks, the KFW, Germany, ICO in Spain, the French Development Agency and uh, its you know, foreign aid agencies setting up explicit programs where they're working together in a sense to sort of coordinate responses in, in global south, particularly around questions of, of water support. And, and healthcare. Uh, so all of that, in a sense, if it's privatized, it gets undermined. Um, and maybe just the final note to say that, you know, the also what David's talking about in terms of corporate, corporatization is, is an issue too, with, even within public banks. There are certainly as if public banks out there, you know, they work as if they're private profit seeking banks because their public mandates have been eroded over time in the context of corporatization. And those, uh, in terms of the book that uh, David and I co-edited along with Dinah Barraclaud, Unctad, you see that difference in those banks that were more corporatized, marketized, that their responses were certainly weaker than those that had a continuing strong public interest mandate. Great. So, that leads me to my next question, which is, I know, David, you've been working uh, throughout your career on privatization of public services and alternatives to privatization. And Tom, you've been working on public banks uh, for your entire career. So I'm wondering if you can address the, the argument that we often hear when we're talking about privatization of services, whether essential services or public services, which is that the private sector is the only one who can do it. Uh, the private sector is the only one with the capital that can actually deliver these services. So I'm wondering if you can talk about the role of finance uh, in the privatization of services and where that agenda comes from in your view. Sure. So, well, let me, let me just set a couple foundations here. I mean, clearly the, the, the logic in, in what I do in terms of 
finance, development, finance and development, and, and my sort of work on public banks, uh, especially around questions of, of like the SDGs and sustainable development, green and just transitions and so on. Um, in the context of 40 years of neoliberalism in the context of 40 years of the ideology that whatever the economic, political, social, ecological problem is, the, the solution to that is to expose it to the market, to privatization, neoliberalism. Um, and so the part of what I've been trying to do is in a sense rectify the myths of this, um, in, particularly in terms of public financial capacity. So for the last 10, 15 years, the World Bank, the United Nations and its new office, the interagency, uh, um, IETF, interagency task force for financing sustainable development has been reproducing the myths that public financial capacity has been in, has, is, is no more than two to five trillion dollars in combined assets globally. And hence there is necessity for the to use limited public financial capacity, uh, maximize that capacity by leveraging uh, private financial resources. So this then becomes formalized in the World Bank's uh, maximizing finance for development strategy and the, um, the, the billions to trillions agenda, which is linked to the sustainable development goals. All based on, on the idea that there's no financial public financial capacity out there, so we need the private sector, and, and therefore, uh, you know, we need to leverage that. Sort of a, a slight revision of where the private sector could do it all pre-global financial crisis, 2008, 2009, to now, well, they can't do it all, or they can't do it, you know, alone. Um, so, in you know, my work is basically a, a traced out. Uh, existing capacity and just in terms of like majority public owned banks, just banks, you're looking at around $49 trillion. So more than tenfold what the UN and the World Bank tells us. And as I mentioned, you know, over 900 institutions globally. If you include multilateral banks, include central banks and include public pension funds, then you're looking closer to the range of $86 trillion in combined public sector assets. And these are relatively conservatively, these banks lend relatively conservatively. So not, not that I'm a lot of monetary theorist advocate necessarily or anything like that, but certainly banks and public banks can leverage more than what they have. So as the need arises, as we saw in 2008, 2009, as we see now, uh, in terms of COVID, they can certainly make money available as and when needed. So the barrier is not institutional. It's not in terms of actually existing capacity. It's really in terms of the predominant narrative that remains to be neoliberal in the sense that the private sector not only is the only one that can resolve the problem, but they're the best place to resolve it. And that public service, public finance to the extent that it exists uh, ought to only support that. Um, and you know that's really the, the sort of Core message. And so the, the obvious response is that, I mean, there's far more public capacity than, than we recognize that we've made use of. Um, but in and of itself, uh, there's also a clear message that just because it's public doesn't mean it's necessarily better. You know, in a sense, you have to make it better, and that requires social forces and, and, and around it. Um, I think we'll come back to the question of blending later and link to the question of financialization, but I, I would also say though that it, it the problem isn't necessarily that um, public banks tap into private finance the the problem is the way they do it and the current blending agenda the maximizing finance for development is all framed around the idea that you need to bend public banks to the needs of private investors you need to align public banks and finance priorities to those of the private sector and you need to wrap private financial investors risks in public guarantees. So it's a qualitatively different sort of framework than having a public bank or institution that is drawing money 
you know, and bonds or whatever from financial markets. And then, you know, in a sense, directing that and, and using forms of private finance for publicly mandated, publicly oriented services, goods, and so on. It's quite different, right? And so I just sort of play with that a little bit right now and sort of set it up. So I'll just add a couple of things to that. I, I find this, and Tom's spoken about the capacity on the public sector side. Uh, which is enormous. Uh, it's not by any means perfect. There's all kinds of problems associated with it, but uh, it's, it's significant and it, the public sector has financed infrastructure for two centuries. Um, so it just, it, it's a, a kind of this strange blind spot and, and it, it made even worse by this uh, seemingly bang your head against the wall until you can sort of, you know, make it happen or you know, squeeze blood from a stone as if if you keep talking about it, the private sector is suddenly gonna pony up you know, trillions of dollars worth of, of financial uh, support for, for basic, basic infrastructure. And it just fundamentally goes against the grain of, of neoclassical economics, which is that you know, these things are, are hard to uh, capture revenues and returns, um, you know, what are sort of classically called market failures uh, and you know, it, there's very, very little incentive for the private sector to invest in general infrastructure. And this, you know, bears itself out empirically. Uh, we just see very, very little private sector investment in basic infrastructure. We see niche investments, Tesla investing in car batteries, for example, but these things are, are drops in the proverbial buckets. Um, I mean, we're looking at you know, up to $50 trillion of investment needed for a transition to renewable energy over the next 30 or 40 years. Uh, and Tesla spending is, is nothing in comparison to this. You know, retrofitting homes, uh, doing renewable energy at scale, et cetera. So it's just simply not happening. And when you look at you know, all the research on private investment in infrastructure shows minuscule amounts of, of investment. And it's, it's even, you know, it's almost nothing uh, in areas where, you know, low income people are. So if you look at water infrastructure to low income neighborhoods or electricity services to low income neighborhoods, the private sector has zero interest in, in doing that. Um, and speaking of interest, they also pay higher interest. <laughs> you know, another fundamental flaw in the whole argument is that uh, private sector loaning is considerably higher. And you look at what's happened here in Ontario, um, you know, the Auditor General a number of years ago put out a report uh, pointing that it was costing the government of Ontario over a relatively short uh, time span, something in the order of $9 billion extra in just private financing costs alone. So it, it's not happening. When it does happen, they, you know, they have to get all kinds of comforts and benefits, which make it more expensive. Um, and avoid the kind of, you know, investment at scale and investment in low in, income areas. So, you know, it, I can't think of any other reason than just blind ideological commitment to the notion that the private sector is somehow going to come up with resources. It, it ain't happening and it's not going to happen. It just fundamentally contravenes basic neoclassical economic theory. Can I add on to that? Because yeah, I, I agree. It, it's, of course, it's ideological, but of course, at the same time, it's very material. And so far as the private sector clearly has a massive interest in, in retaining very stable business <laughs> and stable interest payments from the public sector, which, you know, ultimately are boring on future tax taxes and you know, the work of people in their own societies and so on. Those who pay taxes, in a sense, are paying the interest payments. Um, so it's it's both ideological and and very much material, right? There there's a point in this, and there's a contradiction too. That I think it's important to highlight in this as well because it, it's it's partly in my view it's insane that <laughs> through the sort of continued this agenda of, of you know what we're talking about in terms of public finance supporting or de-risking or you know underwriting private investments. It, it just sort of reinforces exactly what Dave was talking about, that they're not interested in investing in whether they're not going to be making money. And by sort of de-risking and, and absorbing the costs of that, 
the public sector is continuing to sort of support private financial institutions and the amassing of capital and financial capacity within the private sector, while at the same time undermining and minim you know, minimizing their own internal capacity. And so a, a huge part of the debate within the United States with the sort of grassroots public banking movement is exactly about the sort of pulling public financial assets and resources out of private banks and creating public ones simply so that they, they sort of stop that bleeding of, of public resources and tax dollars, essentially people's work and labor into the private sector as a sort of ongoing speculative in instrument. So it's, it's really, you know, and, and the crazy part is that you're continually feeding the beast that refuses to sort of finance and address the, the crisis of, of climate and the crisis of social inequality and so on. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, there's a lot of logic to reinforcing and building up um, forms of public financial capacity where the, the sort of returns on those investments, uh, you know, whether, you know, however that works, you know, remain within the public sphere. So the audience for this series is mostly people who work in international solidarity, such as people who are part of trade unions, also the development community in Canada. And as you both know, Canada has a very rich civil society, um, many organizations who work on global development, doing partnership projects. So I'm wondering if you can help uh, as well as researchers. <laughs> I wonder if you can help us understand uh, what this agenda of what some people call financialization is and why we should care about it, like why it affects those people who want to see less poverty, less social inequality, want to address uh, issues that are important, such as the climate emergency, uh, as well as the current health and economic crises. John, you want to go first again? I'm seeing a pattern here, David. <laughs> um, financialization is, you know, this god awful term. It's become like in many ways. You know, everybody was talking about globalization, you know, around the new millennium, and everything was globalization, and now you know everything now is financialization. So all the new papers are financialization of that, financialization of this. Everything's financialized, and in many ways, it's true, of course. Um, so, you know, the bit more basic definition that people come across financialization is, is simply the sort of increasing importance and logic of finance and financial returns on uh, the impact of, of our everyday lives and over government policy and so on. So financialization is important, the growing importance of finance, which is, of course, self-evidently true. Um, I've always, you know, I, I accept that. Certainly finance is becoming in, 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 in discourse, in material practice, in institutional practice, more significant across every aspect of our lives. Um, but I've also, you know, for me, it's also very historical things. So when I think about financialization, I think about the, and I, and I think about it in social institutional terms, it, for me, it's always been about the internalization of the needs of financial capital into those institutions and state institutions um, into the logic of how they, they sort of run and operate. So financialization is about the internalization of the logic of, of financial accumulation. And so, you know, we look historically and the rise of finance was as ultimately in, in very important historical moments in the 1980s debt crisis, you know, thinking back to Mexico in 1982, through to the sort of big emerging market crises in the mid 1990s, through to the 2008-2009 financial crisis. In each one of these moments, you see an intensification of finance and financial capital, all dependent on state, the, the state apparatus, but state authorities, governments, in drawing in the, the, the risks of private finance that have gone bad. 
right? So the socialization of private financial risk at moments of severe crisis enabled finance and financialization, financial capital, regroup, re, sort of rebuild their power base and then come back stronger and stronger each and every time. So it's really about the internalization of that into our state apparatuses, into the central bank, into the finance ministry, into all of that, all right? And so in an in a intense way, it's, it's very much about the restructuring of our lives to support financial accumulation across the board. Um, and, and, you know, so why it matters is because then we end up paying for it. So, uh, you know, I don't know what the figures are for Canada, but in the case of, of the UK, its response to the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, the, the cost of, of absorbing the losses of that crisis came to, it was somewhere in the range of 80% of GDP for 2010. And that you, you translate that into tax dollars clearly, but also what we see in almost every case of major financial crisis from the developing countries, Mexico, Turkey, to the advanced ones like UK, US, Canada, is, is a direct response, things like the, the GST. So you start getting very aggressive taxation that always go up at times of financial crisis. And so you see a direct pushing of the costs of recovery through the state apparatus onto working class and, and women, at which are always accompanied by privatization or austerity measures and so on. So inevitably the bailouts of these crises fall on workers in one way or another and disproportionately obviously women in the most marginalized and racialized communities. So there's a clear connection there. And, and, and the result, the, the figures in terms of COVID, I was looking at this yesterday, there was the ILO estimates that in the first six months of, of COVID that workers lost something like 255 million jobs for wages totaling something in the effect of Three point around $4 trillion in wages. By contrast, during that same point, the world's richest people, the billionaires of the world, amassed another $4.7 trillion in assets. So, you know, it's a clear, despicable mounting inequality that is very structural to this sphere of financialization. I just add to a couple of points to that. Um, Tom talked about the historical uh, aspects of this, and it's uh, there's a structural dimension here, which where you know, theory helps us understand this in different ways. So the way a sort of liberal understanding of this is is that you can get a few bad eggs who are too aggressive and too greedy, and you you just apply. Um, regulation and put limits on profit taking and bonuses that go to executives and so on, and and you can regulate the financial market. And, and and that's true. I mean, you know, some regulations are better than others, and God knows we need a lot more of it in this world. But um, you know, the other point that Tom is it's financial capital. So this is one facet of capital, and you've got manufacturing capital, you've got agricultural capital. And I think what a more radical theoretical perspective uh, through a Marxist understanding historically of this is, is that capitalism is about competing factions of capital and the way that, that capital behaves. And, and the insight that Marx made 150 plus years ago, which is just as relevant today, is that the ultimate winners are, are finance capital uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and it, part of that structural reality is that capitalism is just inherently prone to crisis and that, you know, you get winners and losers, but the winners are almost always finance capital. They lose you know, certain elements of finance capital win in a boom. They also win in a bust, as Tom just pointed out. Um, and so, you know, certain companies fall out, but then, you know, the existing ones getting bigger. Just look at the financial crisis 10, 12 years ago. Uh, yes, some fell off, but the you know the other financial players just got even even bigger, um, and so there's a, a kind of uh, I hate to use the word inevitable, but you know this sort of inexorable march towards capitalism becoming about finance capital and the marginalization of manufacturing capital and, and agrarian capital and so on. So you know what they used to say 50 years ago that what's good for GM is good for America. 
you know, now it's, well, what's good for Goldman Sachs is, is good for America, so they say. Um, and you even see it in, in you know, non explicitly financial firms. I mean, Google, Uber, Amazon, these are essentially financial capital, uh, you know, uh, firms. They have very little in the way of, of assets. They basically make their money by having a lot of money and they invest in things that allow them to force other players out. So increasingly capitalism is about finance capital and that's a historical trajectory, which you, you can't just fix with, with some regulation here and there. Um, and what it means ultimately is that financial capital is, is calling the shots uh, politically, culturally, in terms of the infrastructure we build, um, and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's a, an insidious and deep-seated phenomenon that uh, we're not going to, to deal with uh, with some uh, regulation and uh, guidelines, no matter how strong they are. Yeah, and to bring us to a Canadian context, I suppose, along what you're saying, uh, along the lines of what you're saying, David and Tom, uh, what is good for the Bank of Montreal is good for Canada and Quebec, <laughs> or Desjardins for that matter. Um, and just to also note that uh, one of the things that uh, in particular, Tom, you mentioned um, that's important and a couple of our other interviewees have highlighted, including Jennifer Del Rosario Malanzo, who's from the Ibon Foundation International, and also Roy Culpepper from the Group of 78, also talking about the importance of thinking about debt again and debt jubilees as having to be a necessary exit to this crisis. 